so uh, hi, uh, welcome to my uh, to, to our talk. Uh, we'll be exploring a little bit uh, about the technology uh, behind our product uh, that we call the Rock, uh, that you can see here. Uh, and uh, yeah, as uh, Chris already mentioned, there will be a couple of us that will talk about different aspects of the software development and testing around this product. Uh, so first, uh, a little bit about me. I uh, have some experience in uh, low-level C++ development, in uh, computer vision, and uh, some years ago I did a PhD in applied mathematics, and uh, right now I'm uh, leading the machine learning and embedded team in uh, Alcatraz. So. Uh, uh, the responsibility of our team is uh, developing uh, this device, uh, and uh, this is a brief outline of uh, what I'll, uh, I'll be talking about. Uh, so I first mention uh, what is our core tech, what are our core features, how do we go about solving them, and then I'll give a couple of uh, examples about uh, a high level uh, overview of uh, the major features that we uh, provide and uh, some technical detail, not too much. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, uh, let's begin. Uh, what, is, what is our core tech? What, what do we provide? What do we try to do with this uh, device? Uh, the, the thing we are trying to do is we are trying to replace uh, or augment uh, this ubiqui the ubiquitous batch reader that uh, is present in a lot of uh, offices and a lot of places. Uh, we are trying to supplement it with uh, facial indication uh, where you can use either one or both. Uh, and uh, we are trying to do all of this uh, here. <laughs> uh, so uh, mm, besides this, we are also trying to do stuff like tailgate detection. Uh, we're trying to support large data set. This, this device needs to be able to work alone or in a fleet of other devices that communicate with each other. And additionally to that, we also integrate with uh, various uh, via video management systems uh, that you can use to directly stream uh, whatever we see. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, these these problems are uh, not so easy to solve, especially on a small embedded device. Uh, so first, I'll give you a quick overview of how how we go about solving uh, solving these challenges. And uh, what is our approach uh, uh, for development? Uh, we um, first we, we start that uh, we we control the full vertical integration of the product. So uh, we do the hardware platform selection ourselves. We select what kind of cameras we'll go. Do we need uh, color cameras? Do we need infrared cameras? Uh, do we need depth streams? Uh, stuff like that. After we selected the hardware, uh, we go about uh, using uh, our own uh, custom Linux image that is based around the Yocto project. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. Uh, that is tailored to our needs. It only has our services. It only has uh, whatever we say is available. Only our ports are open, etc. And the final step, and this is the main responsibility of my team, is developing the applications that run on this uh, device, like uh, uh, reading the frames from the camera, you know, doing face authentication, uh, RTSP streaming, stuff like that. Uh, so uh, how, how, do we develop, uh, how do we develop this thing? Mm. So as you can imagine, we are trying to squeeze as much as possible from this device. Uh, so we are using uh, low-level languages for developing uh, all the heavy hitters that run there. Specifically, we are using uh, C++. Uh, we also need, need to be able to analyze uh, whatever uh, is happening there. So we developed some uh, lightweight uh, tools that don't impact the, per the performance of the device itself, but uh, can actually get tons of algorithmic data per second uh, that we can later use to analyze and optimize uh, our algorithms. Uh, on the machine learning side, uh, you can use whatever model you like, but it, it, it just does not run as well on uh, such a device. So uh, we are uh, doing uh, specialized machine learning models that are tailored for our hardware and still perform uh, you know, nearly state-of-the-art. Mm. We also spend quite some time, of course, uh, tuning uh, our uh, cameras for uh, various lighting conditions. You need to be able to work. Uh, you know, in uh, bright light, in low light, in uh, various uh, rooms, etc. Uh, so uh, we need to be a little bit. Uh, we need to be structured. We are a small team, so we need uh, to be able to uh, move very fast uh, and uh, not worry about, hey, hey, you know, what what we did last year. You know, okay, we can't reproduce it, but you know, let let's redo it again now. 
uh, we focused, uh, we spent some time on uh, doing uh, our, uh, you know, our machine learning infrastructure. We are doing stuff like uh, tracking the, our models, tracking training, and uh, visualizing whenever we, uh, wherever we have errors, stuff like that. And we support uh, training on the cloud, training on-prem. Uh, we're trying to make things as easy as possible for our uh, development. And we also developed some tools for data collection, visualizing this data, and uh, annotating this data. Uh, so now I will uh, mention some of uh, our main uh, you know, features that our product provides. And I will give you a brief overview of what we had to face in order to solve them. Uh, so for the, the main feature, of course, is facial authentication, since you know, if you cannot do the facial authentication OK, uh, you cannot really replace uh, batch readers. Uh, so what are our aims here? Uh, we are trying to accurately identify a single person in a you know, relatively large database of profiles. You have tens of thousands of people enrolled there. Uh, indeed, this uh, also needs to be cheap enough so that it can run on uh, you know, this device. And uh, we are also aiming to be frictionless, so you cannot just stand you know, for 10 seconds there and you have a queue of 10,000. Know, 100 people behind you, uh, so it needs to be fast, and you also need to make sure that you know you don't just show you know your, your phone there and uh, you know suddenly you, you open up uh, the door for everyone. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned several times, this needs to work in a lot of places. I, I wouldn't say everywhere, but you know <laughs> you cannot really say you have you have to modify this lighting here. Uh, you know it, this is no good for us. Uh, so I will focus particularly on uh, one of these issues, uh, on the spoof detection, liveness check. You know, there are different uh, ways you can turn this. Uh, so this is specifically this check to see if this face is real. Is it a mask? Is it a paper? Is it a you know, phone, tablet? Uh, so wh why is this challenging? Uh, it's challenging because uh, unlike other machine learning programs where you have like, vast amounts of data, you can even scrape your own data you know, from the internet, or uh, there are just uh, big data sets of links that you can use to download various uh, data online. Uh, there, are, there are actually not a lot of data sets that uh, tackle multimodal data. And even fewer are targeted for, uh, specifically for liveness detection. And you have various modes of attacks, like I mentioned, papers, band papers, uh, you know, masks, phones, tablets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and even if you find something, uh, it most likely is collected with a specific camera, which uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, you know, computer vision and machine learning, but if you actually collect the data with just a single device, uh, the model itself can learn intricacies of just this specific sensor, so it wouldn't uh, perform very well if you move it to another type of uh, camera. Or, you know, sometimes <laughs> even in the same family of cameras. Uh, so what uh, this brought us is that uh, we needed to do some uh, data collection that we had to organize. We had to, uh, you know, uh, pay uh, actors. We had to hire uh, venues, uh, etc. And we had to plan and uh, budget this. And uh, our final uh, model that we currently use is a combination. Uh, it uses a multimodal input of uh, our color, infrared, and depth uh, streams that we have available on this device. Uh, so the other thing I want to mention is uh, Tailgate. Uh, this is actually a movie. Uh, can you <laughs> just click? OK, anyway, in the movie, <laughs> you, you should be able to see uh, two persons walking through the door. Uh, one of them has access. And you know we, we open the door, they go in. You know, everything is fine and dandy from their point of view. Yeah. However, a nefarious person tracks them behind. And uh, this is when we uh, trigger a tailgate alert that uh, goes to our online platform that uh, Pavel will uh, talk about in a minute. Uh, so, oops. so first, uh, you know, what, what is tailgating, right? Uh, as it turned out, in, when we started doing uh, this feature, everybody had a different opinion what we need to do with it. Uh, so, of course, the first uh, obvious thing is many people say, OK, you know, let, let's just prevent entry. Uh, but doing you know, further uh, thinking about it, 
yeah, we decided that this can actually introduce friction, which is one of our core tenants, that we don't want to introduce friction uh, for our users. Uh, and so what we decided is, uh, I mean, imagine that you're just going for lunch, a big group of people comes back, not everybody authenticates, you know, but you still don't want to close the door, it's just, you know, the front door of your office. Uh, so what we decided is that uh, we'll actually target uh, tailgating uh, alerts upon uh, door entry, and uh, it, will, it will just be alert, but it can send uh, this alert to various uh, places, not only our platform, but also to access control systems that are specified for it, etc. So we distinguish three types of alerts. We distinguish tailgate, where you closely follow someone uh, walking in front of you. Then we also have crossing, when somebody just you know, walks out of the door and somebody that shouldn't be there sneaks in. And uh, the final one is just general unauthorized entry, where uh, you know, somebody propped the door open. You don't know who it is, but somebody who shouldn't be there goes in. Uh, so what, what are uh, the challenges around tailgating? A, as simple as it sounds, you know, on first, <laughs> first view, uh, you actually have to consider that uh, there are multiple variables to consider here that you have to take into account. Uh, so, uh, for example, these people can walk from various angles uh, on this device, and uh, they can uh, you know, try to sneak in, etc. Some people walk very fast, some walk very slow, so you have to be able to you know, properly track all of them. Uh, and you also since we cannot use like very wide angle lenses or fisheye lenses because we want to have accurate uh, facial authentication uh, actually you have to be able to see the door with uh, just uh, you know regularly you know, wide lens <laughs> not not so regular uh, and uh, we also have you know some some clients have uh, small doors some have wide doors some can place the device next to the door some have to place it like a um, half a meter away or something uh, so, just a brief overview, how, how do we solve for these problems? Is uh, First is a hardware solution. I don't know if you can see it easily, but uh, we have a slight 30 degree tilt on the device uh, so that we can actually see the door uh, whenever somebody enters. Uh, then uh, we chose such sensors that uh, they're very, very quick so that, they, that we, you don't need uh, high exposure times, which can lead to motion blur, etc. Uh, and, uh, of course, this allows us to see people better. Uh, then we also track all of these people in, th uh, in, the, in the 3D space at 30 FPS, which accounts for very fast walking people. You know, at 33 milliseconds, you cannot just take a lot of, uh, <laughs> you cannot cover a lot of distance. Uh, and uh, to account for the various uh, doors and uh, specifics that each client has, we expose a lot of controls that they can tweak for their, their specific needs. And in order to uh, benchmark all of this, we gathered, again, hundreds of real-world scenarios where uh, you know, we are trying to simulate this tailgate in various conditions, various attacks, etc. And uh, you know, I, 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 can't, I don't really have the time to go in, in depth in this, but in the end, if somebody has questions, we can answer them. And uh, with that, I will hand the baton to my colleague. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Pavel Zotanov, uh, and as you can see, I'm the full stack team lead at Alcatraz. A little bit about me is uh, I have over 10 years of software engineering experience. Uh, I have worked, worked on large scale applications, and I always had a passion for IoT and embedded devices. And in the last uh, three years, I had the pleasure of working on one. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about how we uh, created the backend so the device actually operates as a fleet and not uh, as a single entity. Uh, I'm going to talk about what was our first in initial idea, what we wanted the product to be, um, how we deployed to pilot clients and what we learned from them and how that actually evolved and changed our product. So initially, when we talked about uh, what we want to achieve, we set out to make a cloud solution, a cloud backend, uh, where the devices can connect. And of course, we needed to develop our own custom synchronization algorithm for the device, because we have a lot of uh, logic we want to apply about security, where different profiles of people go, and why, and what happens when you uh, enroll, and etc. And once we had the basic components of that, we wanted to start 
deploying to pilot clients very early, so we actually can gather feedback and develop the rest of the platform based on those feedback. And of course, clients wanted different ways of visualizing the tailgate events that Max just mentioned, different controls over when you, a person enrolls with his card on the device, it goes to all the other devices uh, that have never seen that uh, person before. Uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the big things uh, that we found out is that um, large enterprise and government institutions actually re are required, sometimes by law, to have their biometric data stored in their own infrastructure behind their uh, firewall and in their building sometimes. Uh, so this created a, a niche for us that we had to solve uh, and solve actually pretty quickly is that we had to move from a cloud product into a non-premise uh, solution for our clients. On the cloud, uh, we had a very standard setup and infrastructure. We had microservices uh, that were running on a Kubernetes cluster. The microservices were uh, written in many different languages. We had some Go, we had some Node.js, we even had some Python scripts running on uh, AWS Lambdas that were triggered when needed. And even though we tried, that wasn't uh, going to work for uh, on-premise deployment for a client because we want the product to be easily installable and easily maintainable afterwards. And uh, that setup required a lot of attention from DevOps people. So then we sat down and thought about what can we do about that? How can we solve that issue? And out of that thinking came out the realization that we would actually have to start from scratch and uh, rewrite the whole uh, backend, basically, so it can fit to an on-premise solution. We chose to rewrite everything in Go, which allowed us to produce native binaries for Windows and Linux and use those to containerize them in Docker and still deploy in the cloud because we wanted to keep our cloud uh, for multi-tenants and for clients that actually didn't care for on-premise and wanted to not manage anything and use directly a cloud solution, which uh, also one of the options we had to get. And um, <coughs> on the cloud, we were using many databases uh, for different, different types of uh, data sets that we had, so we had to move into one. And uh, with all that rewriting, of course, we had to rewrite our CI CD pipelines, so they support this. They can uh, now produce builds for uh, Windows and Linux natively and also deploy on the cloud uh, simultaneously and to QA environments, etc., for testing. And the other thing that we had to solve that was easy on the cloud, especially in the AWS environment, is the backup, debugging, and monitoring of those services. Uh, so we had to uh, do a lot of changes there. Uh, but uh, in the end, by using Go and uh, between the services, so from microservices, we went more into services that are based, for example, one service is doing only the syncing between the devices, one service is doing only the UI. Uh, Another one is doing the firmware upgrades and configuration of the devices. So even if any one of them goes down uh, while Linux, for example, is restarting it, everything else continues to work uh, normally. Uh, we used, between the services, we moved completely uh, into gRPC communication. We used uh, Protobuf to define the APIs and uh, that made it actually quite easy to have different people or teams working on different services and knowing um, what they want to achieve in the end. So we defined the API, uh, people started working simultaneously, and everything uh, worked out great in the end. So here is a small diagram of uh, how actually the rock works uh, in the client. You can see the rock itself is connected to the uh, access control panel, which opens the door, and also to the reader, by which it collects the batch data for the person that is currently being enrolled or in front of the device. Then the uh, rock is, con uh, is connected to the Ethernet, and possibly if the client has a video management system, it goes directly into there, and uh, in the case where he has more than one device, which is all of the cases, it goes into either the 
cloud solution that we provide, uh, or the on-premise appliance we give to some clients, or their own infrastructure if they choose so. So once we are able to produce native executables for uh, the platforms, we actually had to, of course, uh, build installers for those. So we build a Windows installer, we build a Linux installer. Actually, for the Linux installer, we had a specific requirement that it should be a terminal-based one. So people that have, uh, for example, tools for automation of deployment can use those or deploy in a VM, they can just uh, use the terminal to connect the SSH, install the backend, and from there, uh, the same tools can be used to monitor and gather logs. In order to do that, we also had to solve uh, specific platform issues. Like, for example, where do the logs go? On Windows, they're going in their correct place, which is an event viewer. On Linux, they're going into the journal. Uh, so this way, when someone is trying to debug what's happening and why the system is not working and it's an on-premise solution and especially some of our clients require it to be an air-gapped on-premise deployment, so no connection to the internet. They know where to look for what and then in the case where they cannot figure it out, they can send us the log so we can help them and move forward. Uh, another thing we found out and didn't anticipate in the beginning is that uh, many of the clients have uh, unique infrastructures, and we started deploying to clients that were waiting for this feature for a long time, and they call us and say, hey, it doesn't work uh, because the ports you're requiring are actually blocked by our firewall, so we had to adjust the amount of ports we were using and uh, some other network-related issues, uh, which, again, were unique for each and every single client. The last thing that was... Uh, kind of hard is that even though we rewrote all of our code base from scratch, we still had some third-party dependencies. For example, the software we were using for uh, firmware upgrades uh, was not really designed to be deployed on-prem and forgotten about. It was more of a cloud solution that had uh, many services. It used two different databases, so that uh, wouldn't really work for us. And in a very short amount of time, we had to actually produce our own in-house solution for that. And I think those are uh, many of the important lessons that we learned uh, from having a cloud-based product and wanting to move it on-premises. And again, the hardest of those was the air gap where uh, no internet connection is provided, so the installer has to bring all its dependencies with it. Uh, also, uh, unique problems came out that one time Windows decided to update its Defender and Windows Defender decided that one of our services is a uh, backdoor for some reason and <laughs> will not let it work. So, uh, yeah, interesting things uh, came out of the deployments. And during that time that uh, even in initially developing the backend and the rewrite we had to do and moving to the on-premise solution, we always had uh, in mind that the privacy of people is very important. Uh, our rock is not designed to contain any personal information, so once you are enrolled, it creates a biometric profile for that face. Uh, in, if it's connected to a platform, it's going to sync it. The platform is going to deploy it based on the access controls to different doors that this person has access to. We take that out, out of your card, so we communicate with the access control system to figure out, okay, this person needs to be this door, that door, uh, and so on. We, of course, do end-to-end -end encryption on all communication between the rock and the platform, the rocks themselves, uh, everywhere. We have never uh, developed a feature where the rock is tracking or collecting any data or information about someone that has not already willingly enrolled on it. So if it doesn't uh, know your face beforehand, it will just ignore you or maybe in some case uh, give a notification when you try to run in if you are doing a tailgate, as uh, Max explained. And we have added many features in the platform about deleting profiles. We have features where if a profile is not used, it's automatically expired and deleted and cannot be restored back. And we even have a full privacy mode, which when turned on, the 
rocks and the platform stop collecting any kind of pictures of anything, um, which is not that useful in the case of the tailgate because you want to see who actually did the tailgate. But some people uh, actually want the frictionless access and moving fast while you're having a coffee in one hand, a book in the other, you don't want to pull out your card. In, in that case, we don't even collect the pictures, but the device continues to operate normally, simply because of the fact we build your um, biometric profile and we don't need or use the pictures anymore. And that's about it. So now I'm going to give the word to my colleague, Dimitr, who is going to tell you more about how we actually test the rock, the platform, and the integration between them. Thank you, Pavel. So, this is me. My name is Dimitar. I'm leading the QA team in Alcatraz. I've got a little bit of experience in the software testing sphere. I have some certificates and usually I have to travel and ski. So, before going to the agenda, I want to jump in with an abstract. And we have to always consider one thing, no matter we are testing traditional technologies or legacy systems where we have tons of automation or documentation and uh, oracles, etc. Or we are approaching to test modern solutions like machine learning algorithms or AI cutting edge devices, and this is the quality. We have to consider the quality. So these new technologies bring new challenges in front of us and new obstacles that the engineers have to deal, also the testers. The most critical thing that this solution have to make is the decision whether to grant or restrict access. Latest security research shows that malicious physical breach could lead to data loss or value loss for companies that are too costly to measure. They vary from a couple of millions to hundreds of millions or company bankruptcy. So we have to make sure this is a quality solution and impenetrable. No one should bypass this solution and gain malicious success. So the agenda that I'm going to talk about today is topics in the testing in the domain of Alcatraz, which are face detection recognition, its data collection, this is vital part of our testing process, then how we train the machine learning algorithm, because testing is actually training the algorithms, and of course, as a tester, we have to verify the negative part of test case, which in our domain is spoofing, someone trying to bypass or lie the system that there is a human being in front of it. And at the end, I'm going to talk about testing the platform, and our approaches there. So, talk about face detection recognition. What are the challenges in this? It is the same that a human being is detecting that an object is a face or an AI solution. And it's the human face characteristics. Eyes, mouth, nose, ears, hair, etc. Skin temperature and so on. And we can, on top of this, add accessories like glasses, heads, swimming heads, swimming glasses, scarves, etc. And on top of this, we could that environment conditions like lightning, position in the office space, etc. So all of this brings the challenges that we have to solve when we are going to about detecting and authenticating a human face and distinguish between real and fake. So about the algorithms, non-deterministic and deterministic algorithms, what's the difference? Deterministic algorithms are simple one and traditional one where we can 100% predict the output when we have the same input data. Non-deterministic algorithms are more complex and heavy. They're used to solve complex solution in a very small amount of time, where if you attack those problems with traditional algorithms, it will take almost infinite time to solve them. Those algorithms are such that you cannot predict the output even with the same input data every time. So modern machine learning algorithms are developed to be deterministic, but they are proved to be error-prone. What this means, even an insignificant change if the input data, for example, the lightning conditions, could lead to very different output data from the algorithm. And how we, for example, solve this? Let's say a developer comes to me and says, this is a method that detects whether a face is male or female. OK, I appear once, twice, three, ten times. It's say, OK, but is it actually real? What if? One of the 10 times it says I'm female. I discuss with the developer. Let's have different environment conditions, different scenarios with the same person. Run it 20 times, 30 times, 50 times. And then we can have this success rate measuring and we can talk about 
properly algorithm working. And as you can guess now, the data is the critical part. We need lots of data, tons of data, variety of data, and most important is the balance of the data, because if we train more the algorithm in one area, it became biased in this area and less successful in other area. So I'll jump with a small example here. I have just a little group of classification of the short parameters of human face, and we can end in total of 600 combinations with just this sample example. And if we, as I say, run 20 times in different conditions, this test case, the same test case, with a very slight change in the input parameter, we end up with 12,000 tests without even including the accessories that we could have, scarf, heads, glasses, etc. And this is why the data is important. So how we execute the data collection? We make it in different locations because it should be diversity. We collect real-face data, we invite actors, and we collect a couple of hours, a lot of scenarios in different conditions, different accessories, so we can have correctly classification, correctly balanced data, and diversity data in the same time. We organize and store this data appropriately so we can easily approach the training part of the algorithm. How we do the training? We have multiple iteration. On each iteration, we add the right portion of balanced data. After that, we measure the success rate. And then, if we are happy with the success rate, we continue in the next phase. And we have multiple iteration where we add right portion, right balance data to make sure that the success rate remains the same as initially and as we want it. And when we conclude with this, we are approaching to cover the negative tests, which in our domain, as I mentioned, is spoofing. Spoofing is when someone is trying to bypass the system or penetrate the device. So what are the spoof attacks levels in our domain? First one is photo attack, print attack, when someone is showing a photo in front of the device, trying to simulate the human face. The second one is eye cut, nose cut, mouth cut, where you're trying to make some of the characteristic of the person real. Third one is wrapped photo attack, where you're trying to uh, make a 3D effect of the object inside. The next one is replay attack, when you're recording a video or presenting it and presenting it to the device, whether of tablet or phone. And the next one is the 3D mask attack. We have lots of masks in our office. You put a mask of a person that you have, uh, have his picture, etc. And you're trying to mitigate the same uh, face, but with some limitations. And the final one is the makeup attack, when someone is making his face exactly the same as the person he wants to look like, trying to penetrate the system. So how we approach to collect data here is the same way, but we multiply the process six times and collecting the same data, same conditions, same environment variables, but just we multiply it by six in order to mitigate each of these spoofing attacks. And then we have the same data for each of these spoofing attacks. We are approaching to train again the algorithm in this way, not to authenticate, but to uh, detect whether this is real or fake face. We again do the same iterations, we add the right portion of balanced data, and we measure the success rate there. And if you're okay with it, we continue, etc. We have the bug testing iteration with developers and those incremental iterations with balanced data lead us to the same frictionless experience that we state we want to achieve initially. And last part is testing the platform. It's a traditional kind of traditional solution, but our approach here on top of each unit test, API test, UI test, is having a different uh, view like profile synchronization. We have to be sure that the administrator of this platform is able to pick whether the right, the right person has access to the right door to prevent malicious access. And we are testing the synchronization of the network of Huawei AI edge devices that are working correctly. We are testing that configurations has correctly spread the integration. We are testing that whether uh, the range of view, the length of view is the same. Is the device usable? Do we bring this frictionless authentication to the user that we want, no matter of the environment condition? And 
for reliability, is the device working 24 hours? Is the device working all the time? So in case of there is some network loss, is the device continue to work autonomously because it does not need connection to the server? It still delivers the same functionality due to the edge computing part and brings the, this frictionless experience to the users. And finally, we are approaching the scalability. We are testing whether a large corporation could have their employees coming to, for example, in the morning burst, coming to work in the entrance of office on the turnstiles, for example, 10,000, 20,000 people want to grant access with the same frictionless experience that, for example, you can have in a small office. So that's about testing the platform. And uh, I'm going to show you a demo of our device, which is here. We believe that we are revolutionizing the way people enter secure spaces by this. So the device can work in uh, two uh, options. One is the legacy, which is uh, some legacy organizations are using. They're trying to, uh, when an employee comes to the office, they're going to the facility manager. It grants him personal badges, and they have to enroll in front of him. And we have the self-enrollment uh, part where users just batch on the device, and the device learns his face. And after several batches, the user has, uh, has not the need to bring his badge, and he can be just authenticated with his face. And that's about it. Do we have any questions? OK. Just wait for the microphone. Do you guys also test the, uh, that nobody can kind of uh, hack the platform itself? For example, uh, communication between the device and the, for example, upload a profile or something like that. So communication between the device and the platform services happens through the secure layer with certificates. And it's scripted. And to add on top of that, we are going through yearly uh, security reviews meaning that we sent our product to a third-party company that do the penetration testing for us and then give us a certificate for that. Does that answer the question? OK, it doesn't seem that we have more questions. So thanks a lot again. Thank you. Thank you.